Louisiana <laughs> Library Association. Thank you so much for inviting us to your conference today. We're thrilled to be a program in your conference. Uh, this is wonderful, and I hope you enjoyed our rendition of, well, Johnny Cash's rendition of You Are My Sunshine, your state song, which is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Virginia Stanley. I'm the Director of Library Marketing at HarperCollins. Hi, I'm Chris Connolly. I'm the Library Marketing Associate at HarperCollins. Nice to see you all. And I'm Lainey Mays, and I'm the Library Marketing Assistant. So, uh, we have a lot of books that we want to talk to you about uh, in the next 50 minutes. 50 minutes. So, we're going to get right to it. Um, but first, a little housekeeping. If you are aware of our, of our department, then hopefully you're aware of LibraryLoveFest.com, which is our blog and which is where we put everything. So, hopefully you have your handouts. If you don't, everything that we talk about will be on Library Love Fest, so you can get it there. Uh, this is um, a Facebook Live, but we are specifically talking to the attendees of the Louisiana Library Association, who have so graciously um, invited us to be part of their conference. So thank you. And without further ado, we will talk to you about some books. Who's going first? Uh, I think I'll lead us off with an incredible author that many of you probably know of, uh, Laura Lippman, Lady in the Lake. Uh, so her last novel was Sunburn, um, which I know was a Virginia Stanley favorite. I think it really, she's she's a revered author. She's a New York Times bestselling author, but I do think that kind of catapulted her to a, a new level of recognition. And this is a wonderful follow-up. It's a standalone. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Laura Lippman, she wrote Wild Lake, as well as the standalones What the Dead Know, I'd Know You Anywhere, The Most Dangerous Thing, After I'm Gone, and Sunburn. Uh, she splits her time between Baltimore, Maryland, and New Orleans, so uh, some local uh, relevancy there. And regardless, she's just an incredible thriller author. Um, this is, again, another standalone that takes place in 1960s Baltimore and follows this middle-aged housewife who decides that she needs a change in her life. She has a child. She's been married for two decades, essentially. She decides to leave her husband and pursue a career in journalism, which, again, this is the 60s, so you don't really divorce and you don't really become just like a single woman living on, her, on your own, but that's what she does. And she becomes kind of obsessed with this case of this, this young, beautiful African-American woman who was murdered. She was disappeared, or she disappeared, and no one knew what happened to her. No one seemed to care, except for Maddie, this investigative journalist. So it's this fascinating look at kind of Maddie finding her way through this very competitive, male-dominated journalism um, industry. But also you get this very interesting look at the racial disparities in Baltimore. You get a view of Cleo, who's this young woman who died, and uh, she is the lady in the lake. And you get these really interesting viewpoints where she, you kind of get the viewpoint through Cleo. She's passed away, she's at the bottom of this lake, but she's aware of what Maddie is doing and how Maddie is trying to get to the bottom of her death. And it's just this really interesting dichotomy. I just think Laura is a master of the thriller and suspense genre. I just, I don't think anyone does it better than her. And when you're reading this, I think you'll realize that you'll just, I, there are passages where you're just like struck by the power of her writing. Um, but it's also just, a, it's a great genre thriller, but has a lot of weight to it. Um, so it's coming July 23rd. I do hope you'll check it out. Um, she's, again, just, an author not to be missed. We absolutely adore her here. So that's Lady in the Lake by Laura Lipman. Lainey, do you want to talk next and do you want to talk about what you brought today in honor of Louisiana? So one of my favorite things about Louisiana are beignets. So I had to go get beignets. It was just an excuse to eat beignets. But <laughs> I have some lovely ones. They, I hope they're still hot. They ah. were made fresh this morning. I saw them. Mm. Um, so we get to enjoy them. Mm. Off camera, maybe. Off camera. <laughs> It'd be really messy if we did it on camera. I, I tried eating spaghetti at a, on a past <laughs> Facebook Live, and people noticed. <laughs> so I'm, I'm we'll stepping wait. back from that. We'll wait. But yeah. We'll let you know that We'll end up looking like Al Pacino from Scarface. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Sugar high. Um, so do you want me to? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the first one I'm going to talk about Can is the <laughs> Oysterville Sewing Circle by Susan Wiggs. So this is Susan Wiggs. We all love Susan Wiggs. All libraries love her. She's the number one New York Times bestselling author of over 50 novels. She knows what she's doing. And this is just classic Susan. She really deals with um, themes of hope and loss and 
kind of healing and getting on with things. And this, she does this <laughs> very well in this new uh, book, The Oyster Bill Sewing Circle. So I'm going to set this. Can you oh, sure. Hold it mm -hmm. So in this, we follow Caroline Shelby, who lived in a small town of Oysterville, Washington. It's a real place. And it's based on a real place. The story is not real. But she lived in Oysterville, and she went to New York. She wanted to be a fashion designer. And she got there. She kind of had it all. She was working in the fashion industry. She had a friend, Angelique, who uh, has two kids of her own. So she kind of made her own little family in New York. But then a lot of things take a crazy turn. So Angelique dies of an overdose, unfortunately. And then the fashion industry kind of hits her out of it by stealing some of her designs. So she's kind of on the outskirts. She has these two little kids. Angelique doesn't have anybody else. She is an immigrant. So she takes Flick and Addie, her two little kids, under her wing, and she decides to go back to Oysterville and try to reconnect. She feels really beaten down. Her family's there, so she's going to, literally from New York to Washington, so across the country, she's going to go try to rebuild her life and kind of give these kids a normal upbringing that they might not have had. So when she goes, she reconnects with several people, her family included, but also Eric Jensen, who she knew as a child and kind of was an old flame in a way. So that blossoms on its own side. Um, but also she meets the woman who taught her to sew. She has a sewing shop and she is starting to find out that Angelique had some dark past and some dark secrets that she didn't know about, uh, a few assaults and things like that. So as she's speaking and trying to figure that out, because she didn't know, she felt like she needed to do something about that. This uh, woman who taught her how to sew, she's like, well, I had that experience as well. So she creates this little group called the Oysterville Sewing Circle, and it's all women. They get together weekly and talk about their past and um, a, abuse that they've been through or physical assaults, and she just really makes this home bend to her, and she finds her new family there, and she uh, brings these kids up in a loving environment. So it's really timely, the Me Too movement. It really captures the spirit of women coming together and helping each other and supporting each other. And it's about coming home, but it's, and it's a love story. She has this with Eric, but also with her family and these two kids. It's really, it's, it's really beautiful and it's timely. And this cover, it's just like, I love it. It's red and it just shows you that like, it really, it's a me too thing. It's, we're gonna stop and we're gonna talk about it and she's sewing these lives together. So that's Susan Wiggs Oysterville Sewing Circle. Out in July. I jumped in. Oh, sorry, out in August. <laughs> okay, um, so I will be talking again about a very, very cool book. Um, this is Never Have I Ever by Jocelyn Jackson. We love Jocelyn Jackson. She is like an incredible personality. She's a huge friend of libraries. Um, and she's a beloved author. And her books are always very smart and clever and oftentimes very funny, but they also get to the heart of some very serious issues. And this is a bit of a depart departure for her in that it's a thriller. It's a domestic thriller, but still like very Jocelyn Jackson. You'll know you're reading her um, w with this book. And it takes place in kind of like this seemingly ordinary suburban setting, as you can tell kind of from someone described this as creepy Celeste Ng, this jacket, which That's I fine. love. Um, and it follows this woman who's living a relatively ordinary life. She's very satisfied. She has a best friend. She has her daily routines, which she cherishes. And this very regimented life is quickly disrupted by this new, um, a, a new neighbor, this new person in her community. Uh, Ro, who is this kind of very beautiful, kind of alarmingly so, almost uh, threateningly so woman who kind of weaves her way into uh, Amy's group of friends. And she institutes, or she kind of goes them into starting this game of Never Have I Ever, where they, you know, they reveal their deepest, darkest secrets. And, you know, when you're with people you trust, that's not an issue, but Ro has other intentions at play. So this whole story is kind of this this cat and mouse game between Amy and Ro and and this kind of matching of wits and it's it turns dangerous. And it deals again with some dark topics, but Jocelyn just has such a deft hand with everything she does and she handles it so intelligently. It's an excellent read. It really is. And it just got an incredible starred review from Booklist of which I have here. Um, I won't read the whole thing, um, but I want to read this last part. Um, current fans will recognize Jackson's exquisite writing, 
reminiscent of Marissa de los Santos and Ann Patchett. Those are no small words there. Even as her plot takes them around corners they didn't see coming. Never have I ever marks a new high in Jackson's career that will attract new readership. That's a starred book list review. That's going to be in the April 1st issue. Um, completely agree. I just, it, we, Jocelyn, Jocelyn has this upward trajectory, and I think this book is so fresh and so incredibly executed. New Current fans will adore it, and I think this will win over her plenty and plenty of new fans as well. So we're so excited. This is coming July 30th. I have a, like, a novel's worth of blurbs on this book as well. Um, but just, I, I highly recommend checking it out. So if you want a copy of the book, just let us know. I want to get this in everyone's hands. So please do. And, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Then I can uh, get the, check out the reviews on Edelweiss. Yeah? Yes, Edelweiss. It's also <laughs> available on NetGalley. So um, all, all the goods are there. So now it's just about reading it. All the goods. Uh, all the goods. Okay. Uh, so the first book I'm going to talk about is The Dutch House by Ann Patchett. How beautiful is that jacket? Um, this is, uh, Ann Patchett is, is the New York Times bestselling author, uh, long listed for the ALA Andrew Carnegie Award, numerous, numerous awards. Uh, she's a bookstore owner. Uh, she opened up uh, Parnassus Bookstore down in Nashville, Tennessee back in 2011, I think. Um, anyway, uh, we just recently had our sales conference, HarperCollins had their sales conference, and she made a surprise visit, much to our, uh, happiness and joy because she's absolutely lovely and we are so excited that this uh, is a drop in title for the fall so it's important that we um, make sure that everybody knows about this book um, this is a story about um, si two siblings um, and the ramifications of what uh, that that uh, happened because their uh, home that they uh, they live in a house called the Dutch house their father uh, at the end of um, the Second World War, had on a hunch uh, bought this estate in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And it, it just turned into this very lucrative um, decision that he made. And so uh, they had not been uh, very well off, but this decision that he had made, this hunch that he took to purchase this home, uh, turned out to be one of the smartest things he ever did. Um, uh, when uh, so the two children in this in this story they grow up there, their names are uh, Danny and and Maeve. Uh, they're exiled from the house that they grew up in from their by their stepmother. She doesn't want them there, and so out they go. And that's right in the very beginning. You meet these kids, and it's a, it's taught. It's right right from page one. Uh, you she paints this picture very clearly about this house and the tension in the house and how they're not wanted. Um, and so they are, they're, they're out. And uh, so this life that they sort of, you know, had, had known and enjoyed and, and, uh, and uh, with, you know, the, the money and the fortune that was there is now gone. And they're back to uh, from whence they came. Uh, not a lot of money, and, uh, but they have each other. And that is the core of this whole thing is it's about family. And Patrick writes about family like nobody does. Um, and uh, and uh, relationships and fallout. If you read Commonwealth, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so they only have each other. And so now that this, you, there's a great line, do you think it's possible to ever see the past as it actually was? I asked my sister. We were sitting in her car parked in front of the Dutch house in the broad daylight of early summer. And uh, it's them talking about their lives and it's about inheritance, it's about family, it's about love, it's about betrayal, it's so juicy. And, and uh, the end Stay till the end, and it won't. It's not a hardship to stay till the end because you're flipping the pages until you get to the end, and uh, to see what happens to uh, to these two grown children, Danny and Maeve. So we're thrilled to have her back. Uh, not that she was ever gone, but we're thrilled to have another standalone and a beautiful one at that. So that's the Dutch House by Ann Patchett. That goes on sale September twenty fourth. Okay. All right. So I will go again, and it's. I'm going to talk about a book by. Honorary LLF member Jean Kwok, Searching for Sylvie Lee. Uh, we love Jean here um, on our team. She's coming to the office. She's incredible and smart and energetic and supportive. And this book is so, so powerful. Um, you'll know Jean from Girl in Translation, which was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, she is, this book is described as early Amy Tan meets Celeste Ng. Uh, it's, I, I was, 
about to call it a genre mashup, but I don't think mashup doesn't indicate precision and poise, which is what this novel does. It's part thriller, part family drama, part mystery, where it follows this family, Sylvie, who is this beautiful, very successful um, young woman from a Chinese immigrant family. So you follow her, and she's this golden child uh, who was raised in the Netherlands. Um, her parents in, in Queens, New York, really couldn't raise her. She was the first child. They were poor. And so they sent her to the Netherlands to be raised. And she always kind of dealt with being an other there, and she went through a lot while being raised by her uh, aunt and uncle. Um, but she disappears, and no one knows why. She travels to the Netherlands, she tells different people different reasons, but she goes to the Netherlands, disappears, and then you follow her, her sister, Amy, who's younger, she's kind of sheltered, she's very shy, not comfortable in the world. But Amy has to kind of shed all of that and get to the bottom of what happened to Sylvie. And this novel's told in different voices. You get Sylvie, I mean, who's very observant and sharp and educated. You get Amy's voice, who is, again, very sheltered and kind of scared and, and, and tentative. And you also get their mother's voice. And, and, and their mother is, again, a, a Chinese immigrant. She's, and it's all in English, but um, Jean really like, has this excellent way of crafting each character's voice to really display their, their kind of place in life. Um, so again, it's like this family dynamic where you explore what happens with these expectations, what it means to be an other, uh, whether it's here or overseas, and kind of what it means with like familial expectations and what's not said and what is said. It's just done so, so well. Um, I absolutely adore this novel. It just sticks with you. It's just so poignant and it sticks with you. And again, I have a new starred review for it, which I'm so happy to share. Um, this is, again, this is going to be in the April 15th issue of Booklist. And uh, it says, reading Kwok's third novel after Mambo in Chinatown, uh, and, uh, Ella, excuse me, yes, Girl in Translation, thank you, Lainey, is like mm -hmm. watching an artist create a pencil drawing. She lays down the initial outline, then builds on it with shading and nuance until everything comes together at the stunning end. Her sharp and surprising language transports readers across the globe on a breathless and emotionally complex journey. Excelling from every angle, this is a can't-miss novel for lovers of poignant and propulsive fiction. That's a star review, uh, and I think that says it all. This is a novel not to be missed. Here's the jacket, which is also beautiful. Um, so I do hope you'll check it out. It's available on NetGalley, Edelweiss, and it's uh, coming June 4th. So that's Searching for Sylvie Lee by Jean Kwok. You are next, yes. So next we're gonna talk about American Entrepreneur by Willie Robertson and William Dole. So when we think Louisiana, this was the first thing we thought of because <laughs> Willie Robertson is from West Monroe and I've actually been by, so he's the Duck Commander CEO and he's on Duck Dynasty, which ran for like 11 seasons, which is crazy. Um, but he is just this powerhouse for this small business. His father, Phil Robertson, made and he kind of blew it to an international scale um and i've actually been by it and you think it's going to be this huge building and it's just teeny tiny mm -hmm. um but so he lives in west monroe in louisiana and this is his yeah. third thank you this is his third book he had the duck commander family and the american fisherman before but american entrepreneur is something different it's it is memoir-esque it has his life story because he did kind of take this business to something uh, to a whole nother level but it's just it's also about the entrepreneurship of America and all of the people that built America and the, and how they took their kind of pulled themselves by their bootstraps so he goes through like first the Native Americans and all the systems that they put into place and he goes to George Washington and how he founded this country then he goes to Astor and Vanderbilt and Carnegie and kind of that era and then he goes even into the to the modern world the jobs the gates and the um, all of them. So it's just, he it, it kind of breaks it down and shows different ways that these Americans have really built their businesses and then he kind of puts himself alongside them. He talks about his past. When he was a kid, he uh, got in trouble for selling candy on the bus. He would take it and kind of get custom orders and bring people candy. And so he got in trouble. So he had to go work in his dad's shop and kind of put boxes together and then that kind of blew up into what he is now. But I think it's really interesting. It's you know, you see all of the histor history and then you kind of see this modern day entrepreneur and how he's doing it in a really small town in West Monroe. Um, but 
It's really cool, and he does it alongside his co-writer, William Dole. And this is going to be in paperback. This is the hardcover. It's already out, so you can get it now. But the paperback is coming out November 19th in 2019, so be sure to be on the lookout for that. Okay. Um, so the next book is, well, we don't have a jacket yet, but this is Karen Slaughter. And she is lovely looking. And she is a <laughs> lovely person. And uh, when we have a jacket, we'll put it online. But right now, um, we, um, yes, so excited about Karen Slaughter's book. So this is The Last Widow. This is, uh, she's back to her Will Trent series. It's been um, three years since the Will Trent uh, series uh presented itself and now he's back with Sarah Linton and uh you know uh, Karen does these terrific standalones and every so often she'll do the Will Trent Sarah Linton and then she comes back and does a standalone and boy she just hits it out of the park every time so uh, and no exception here uh this is uh this is taking place in uh Atlanta and um it's uh this is pretty cool this is uh this starts off with a, there's a kidnapping and a scientist for um for the CDC, the Center for Disease Controls, uh, is grabbed by assailants uh, in a shopping center and vanished. And authorities are trying to find out where this doctor is. And then a month later, um, there's um, there's uh, one of Atlanta's uh, busiest um, neighborhoods, the location for Emory University, as well as this, uh, the CDC and the FBI headquarters and two major hospitals. This is like the hub. Uh, there's There's a bombing. Um, so, so Sarah Linton and, and Will Trench, uh, he's an investigator with the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, so they rush to the scene um, and they see that there's this conspiracy that threatens to destroy thousands of innocent lives. And then assailants abduct Sarah. And so now Will is on the hunt to, uh, to find her, save her, and prevent a massacre. So um, it's explosive, it's, it's complex, it's complicated. It's fast-paced. It's compelling. It's it's Karen Slaughter. She's amazing. Um, so that's that's the structure of the Last Widow. Important to note, kind of cool, exciting news that just um, uh, was announced, I think, last month, is that um, so uh, Karen's previous book, Pieces of Her, has been optioned, um, has been picked up by Netflix, and they're going to do an eight-episode uh, series. Uh, so they're currently developing that. There's not an air date yet, but that is so cool. That is such an exciting thing. Um, so anyway, um, Karen Slaughter, she's just a, she's a freight train of books, scary books. <laughs> um, but we, uh, and pieces of her are so good. So anyway, you just pick up a Karen Slaughter and just get lost in that world. So that's uh, The Last Widow, um, Karen Slaughter going on sale August 20th. So plenty of time to get ready and order up some books. Mm -hmm. People are asking about our bobbleheads, Virginia. So, Do tell. Um, yeah, so we had a lovely Groupon deal for custom-made bobbleheads. Uh, so, of course, we pounced on it, and they Thank came you. out interestingly. Uh, <laughs> they look nothing like us. <laughs> Except for they are excited about books, and um, <laughs> they nod a lot. I don't know, I nod a lot. So they got that right. Yeah. Uh, I'm told mine kind of looks like me. I don't know. Mixed with Steve Jobs, like yeah. he says. Maybe they're aspirational. That's As what we want to be. I look like Maud. <laughs> Remember that Beatrice Arthur see show in the 70s? <laughs> Lady Godiva was a freedom rider. Remember? <laughs> what, what am I wearing that for? And who is that? <laughs> anyway. I only wish I was as fashionable as mine. <laughs> I sense a Halloween costume opportunity. Perhaps. Yeah. But anyway, yes. That's we a whole nother level if you go as yourself as a bobblehead. Yeah, I like it. Oh, my God. Anyway, let's all tap our heads when we to answer the question, how much do we love Louisiana? A lot? Yeah, yes. we do. Yay, Louisiana Library Association. So we have beignets, we have bobbleheads, because why not? And what's that? This is a candle scented like Louisiana. I'm going to read the description. Southern bouquet of magnolia honeysuckle, and country jasmine, balanced with salty scents of the pelican state, and notes of Louisiana, sweet potato, and light citrus. Mm, I'd rather beignet. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, that's so beautiful. It, it is really beautiful, is. and it smells, I, I, I couldn't open the box, I have to admit, I was struggling Ooh. with the box. Um, for any Louisiana nice. people who are watching, if you want to ask a question through our friend Jeremy, who's moderating this, uh, so I see cute. Vicky Nesting also commented, commented, submit a question, we'll send you, again, a copy of these books, uh, we'll choose a few people, send a copy of these books, 
We'll also hook you up with this delicious candle. It is delicious. I want a job writing for perfume boxes. Right. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. I don't know. You guys, you got to smell this. Okay, smell that. It smells, it's beautiful. Mm. On the other Come side on. of the coin, we have Crystal Louisiana hot sauce. I ordered this. I don't know why it's in every grocery store in Brooklyn. But <laughs> <laughs> That's um, very funny. I don't know if you have hot sauce recommendations, those of you in Louisiana, for like the genuine article. This is what came up on Google, but uh, I'd like some wisdom from the ground. So uh, let us know. So yeah, that's yeah. And are people getting got, be entered to win all these books if we if they send in a question or yes, something? Yes, exactly. In and I know How's many of you uh, at the conference are watching, and uh, I know Jeremy Ballum is moderating. So just if you have a question, have either Jeremy ask it and let him know your name, so we, we can pick you maybe. Um, or if you have your smartphone, just ask a question in the comments uh, if you're watching via that method. Again, for this one, it's for Louisiana Library Association attendees. For those of you who are not part of that, do not fret. Uh, we do this every month. We do Facebook Live, and we're always giving away books, so you'll have your opportunity as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. That's so now back to so we have to end at ten twenty at tw at ten fifty. So yes. oh my god, that would be, I just gave myself a heart attack. Okay, so we have a lot of books to get through, so we're gonna do yes fast fast. Great. Here we go. All right. Gone Dead, Christopher. Gone Dead, that's me. Columbus. All right, I have a great southern novel for you all, The Gone Dead by Chanel Benz, uh, who first caught my attention because... She, she, oh, thank you. Uh, because she had this great blurb from George Saunders, who is one of my favorite authors, uh, who uh, calls her a riveting new voice in American fiction. Uh, she had a short story collection, The Man Who Shot Out My Eye is Dead, which really garnered her a lot of attention and buzz. And so this is her debut novel, and it takes place in the deep south of Mississippi. And it's a very propulsive story that deals with a lot of timely issues, race, criminal justice, police brutality, poverty. Um, but the story itself is really, really interesting. It follows Billy James, who is now kind of in her like early 30s, uh, but she has a very interesting past in that her father was this renowned black poet in Mississippi who died when she was young. And her memory, she was only four, her memory is very foggy about this occurrence, but she inherited this like little shack way out uh, just in the country with like barely any neighbors. And she's now just getting back. And this house and the surrounding area just holds a lot of pain and a lot of memory for her. Um, but when she goes back, she meets kind of these characters that were potentially involved with her past. And she also discovers that when her father died when she was young, Billy actually disappeared for a number of days and no one knows where she went and she doesn't even recall this. And all of this kind of feeds into each other where you have this mystery of what actually happened to her father but also what happened to Billy and why doesn't she remember any of this. Um, the setting is just, she, she has a very like lyrical literary voice. Um, it's very approachable, it's gritty at the same time but she just has a really incredible way of painting this kind of lonely poverty-stricken, but also very sparse uh, kind of setting of this novel. But the characters, especially Billy, as you see her grow and develop and discover kind of more about her past, it's riveting. Um, and I'll just read this quote. Uh, th this is from uh, Keith Lehman, who wrote Heavy. Uh, the greatest novels in my world are all, are nearly all placed in Mississippi. The Gone Dead is one of the greatest novels ever placed in Mississippi. The Southern novel will never be the same after this book. Billy James, the protagonist, holds more mystery, lyricism, tragedy, nuance than most characters I've read in recent years. It seems almost unfair to contemporary writers that Chanel Benz has created a plot equally as fresh as Billy James herself. Uh, so we'll be hearing a lot more about this novel. It's coming June 25th. Um, this is for fans of Jasmine Ward and Tayari Jones. I think people are hungry for these kind of stories. They need to be read, they need to be written, they need to be published. And luckily for us, we have one, and it's powerful. So we please do check it two out. two questions. One, first novel. It's her first novel. First she novel. She has a, a short story. Yes, yeah, so uh, The Man Who Shot Out My Eyes is Dead is her debut short story collection, which we published about a year back. And the, so this is her debut novel. And they Good want question. to know what her writing is, who she writes like. Maybe there's a constant. Yeah, well, and, and again, Jasmine Ward would be okay. a good comp, um, and then Tayari Jones. So I highly recommend uh, if you're fans of them. Let me see if there's any others. I think those, uh, another great novel that we published, kind of Southern novels, Stephanie Powell Watts, mm -hmm. um, who, um, let's see here. Yeah, No One Is Coming to Save Us, which was the inaugural Jessica uh, <coughs> uh, Parker. Sarah Jessica Sarah Parker. Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. book club pick. So. Thank you. Yeah. 
So, All right. No. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> One Night in Georgia is what I'm going to talk about by <laughs> Celeste O. Norfleet. So, One Night in Georgia, and we know Celeste. She's a nationally best-selling author. She has more than 20 acclaimed commercial fiction novels. She's won six awards from the Romance Slam Jam to the Lifetime Achievement Award. She, she's wonderful, and this is her newest novel, One Night in Georgia. So, <clears throat> in this, it's in the tradition of Alice Walker's Meridian. Um, in the summer of 1968, we have three friends, Zelda, Veronica, and Daphne, who are co-eds coming back from New York City. They're going to Spelman College. That's where they all go, and it's going to be their senior year. They're really trying to save all their memories and have a good car trip, but it's in the wake of all of the assassinations and all of the um, Black Power movement and all of these things are happening they are all traveling by the Green Book. And I know if you watch the Oscars, everyone's wanting more information on this. They really want to know more. And this book is a great one to put with that book. Um, so they are following, they're going to Atlanta. So from New York to Atlanta, they're going to hit several spots that are very interesting. And as they follow this Green Book, they, they hit Washington with all of the riots. And then they go more towards the Mason-Dixon line, they get to Georgia and they are caught up in a really hostile situation with, and it involves a, um, a white person that ends up dead and one of the girls is holding the gun. So it's, it's unfortunately very timely and it kind of mirrors some of the things you're seeing and hearing about and violence, political climate that we're all uh, unfortunately hearing about. Um, I think it's going to have a lot of great discussion topics, good for book clubs. And isn't that cover just beautiful? Mm. I love this cover. Mm -hmm. um, so it comes out on June 18th. So be sure to check it out. Okay. Uh, the next book is How to Forget. And ironically, I forgot to bring the book with me. But I have this jacket. And this is all you need to know. I don't know if you can see this. Scooter, can you see that? Mm. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Good enough. Uh, this is... Um, Kate Mulgrew, author, actress Kate Mulgrew. Uh, many of you know her from Ryan's Hope or Star Trek or Orange is the New Black. She also wrote a memoir several years ago called uh, Born with Teeth. Uh, we did not publish that book, but we are the proud publishers of How to Forget, which is a story of, uh, it's her story <coughs> of going back to Iowa to care for her ailing parents. Um, and uh, it's her, her mother has uh, early uh, Alzheimer's disease and her father has been diagnosed with terminal cancer with not long to live. And so she goes back to care for them and this is that story. It's a story of her relationship with them. It's a story of them before they ever married, before they ever had children. It's their stories. Uh, the book is divided into two, one half the father, one half the mother. I could go on about this book for forever. If you go to Library Love Fest right now, uh, we have pinned to the top of the page an interview that I had the honor of interviewing her last Friday here at the video studio, and it was, it was uh, just, just a terrific interview, and you get a great sense of what this book is about. It is, it is. There's equal amounts of humor in it. It's a cr big, crazy Irish family, tons of kids. They live in Iowa, and it's, it just goes back and forth. It's not a linear book. You know, you sort of get snippets of her of her life um, and, and the lives of her, of her family and growing up and, um, and what happens when parents start to age and, and get ill. Um, so I think this is a universal story for many people. You do not need to be a fan, uh, a follower, I should say, of her work uh, as an actress to appreciate what is in this book. We got a quote yesterday from Maxine Blyweiss, who is the former director of the Westport uh, Public Library. She's a library consultant now for Maxine Blyweiss and Associates. I just want to read this real quickly to you because I really feel that uh, she gets this and I, this, is, um, this is the point that I'm trying to make. How to Forget leaves you wishing you had read it before going through the hardest role for an adult child, being witness to your parents at the end of their lives. Whether the reason is cancer, Alzheimer's, or natural causes, this book by Kate Mulgrew left me wishing I had read this book before going through the challenge of how to be the best daughter for my parents last months. Mulgrew's insight will stay with me for a long, long time and be on my recommendation list for all who are saying goodbye to their parents. Yes, it's sad. Again, moments of great humor. I laughed, I cried, I love this book, and I can't uh, recommend it highly enough. That's How to Forget by Kate Mulgrew. It goes on sale in May. Okay. Um, for 
it's, it's me again. You're getting a lot of me on the front end, but uh, I'll get out of your hair soon. Let's see. Uh, I have After the Flood by Cassandra Montag. This is a huge book for us. It was uh, highly sought after at the London Book Fair. It's already been optioned, I think, by, let's see. Um, God, I can't see the production company. Um, Churn and Entertainment, excuse me. Uh, who are going to produce it, um, and they're pitching it as the hands ma Handmaid's Tale meets Game of Thrones, which is, I think, a great comp. Um, also, Station Eleven, Zone One, and The Road. This is a powerful, epic, sweeping debut uh, that takes place a little more than a century from now, but nonetheless very timely. The world has essentially been completely flooded, and most of society now just has, they have these little kind of mountaintop uh, villages and things are overall pretty dangerous. I mean, resources are low, and uh, we follow one mother, Myra, who is taking care of her feisty eight-year-old daughter, um, but eight years ago, her eldest daughter was kidnapped by uh, her, Myra's former partner. And so Myra is kind of living her life, but decides now is the time to go. She receives a hint that someone has seen her eldest daughter, um, and so she takes her young daughter and sets off on this kind of, I don't want to say high seas, but you know, this adventure across the ocean and across all these very perilous situations to discover what happened to her eldest daughter. This world is so well fleshed out and it's dangerous and all the various societies that have kind of erupted in, you know, in the midst of this destruction are incredibly interesting, but it's a perilous journey. Um, it's it's just epic and again sweeping and I have this good quote from Publishers Weekly, uh, Liv Constantine who wrote The Last Mrs. Parrish also loved this novel, they called it haunting and shocking. Publishers Weekly says an intriguing and innovative women-centered swashbuckling quest narrative centers on the social impact of climate change a little over a century from now. Readers who enjoy post-apocalyptic fiction and strong female heroes will appreciate Myra, a super survivalist who combines Wonder Woman's physical prowess and the unsinkable Molly Brown's resilience. Um, yeah, this is going to be a big book. It's coming September 3rd, so you have a little time. I think it is actually now up on Edelweiss, so I highly recommend you give it a read because um, it's unique and it's powerful, so please do check it out. Okay, so now we have Rebel by Beverly Jenkins, and we love Beverly. Beverly has won so many awards that we would be here all day if I read them all, but just related to libraries, she was the recipient of the 2018 Michigan Author Award by the Michigan Library Association. So that's exciting. Um, and she, this is her first book in her new series, the Women Who Dare series, who it's following the aftermath of the Civil War. But in this first book, we see a Northern woman, Valinda Lacey. She goes to New Orleans and she wants to help this a newly emancipated community survive and flourish. And when she gets there, she sets up a school. But then some people uh, take over the school and they kind of, um, oh, I don't know what the word, I'm, I just totally missed it. They just deplete the school, they ramp, rampage over it. And so they try to target her, so she has to run for her life. And she, of course, runs into the arms of Captain Drake Levesque. And he's an architect from an old New Orleans family, but he is really uh, with her in this fight to build this community up and make it a safe place. Um, so exciting news. Her Deadly Sexy Book, Beverly Jenkins. It's an Amazon Prime movie now. You can go check that out. And it's the actor in that movie is this man, which I thought was kind of oh, interesting. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. Um, so be sure to check this one out. It's, we have a great quote from Publishers Weekly really quickly. Jenkins addresses sensitive, serious issues in a tactful, realistic manner, and she brilliantly balances the real sorrows of history with a shimmering romance. This is a grand tale of finding happiness in hard times. So be sure to check out Rebel by Beverly Jenkins. It's the first in the series, so you'll have many more to go. Yeah, awesome. Huh? You want to go? Since I, you can. Oh, I don't care. Okay. I can go. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, the Perfect Fraud, a debut thriller by Ellen LaCourt. How cool is this jacket? Uh, so this is about two very strong women. What? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, with uh, dark secrets. One is the mother of a sick child. The other woman is a psychic. Or is she? So we meet Claire, and uh, she is she is a, a one of a, in, in the family the family business of uh, psychics. Uh, her mother is world renowned, and she uh, she uh, and 
she thinks that Claire is too, and Claire is trying to avoid her mother at all costs because actually she can't really do it, <laughs> and she feels as if she is a fraud. Um, okay, that's Claire. And then we meet um, we meet Rena, who is this divorced mother with a four year old child, who the child is constantly sick. No matter how many doctors she takes her to, she can't get better. These two women's lives collide, and um, and from there starts this psychological, very sort of twisty um, story. They're um, they're very carefully constructed lives just sort of explode, and they see like how how can they help each other. So it's strong women making difficult choices about love and family. It's twisty. It's a psychological thriller about lies and truth and how we all have something to hide. It's got witchcraft. It's got psychics. So it's kind of interesting. It's a little something extra to add into this mix. Um, there's a great quote from Amy Malloy who wrote The Perfect Mother, which was a great bestseller, New York Times bestselling author. She says, be sure to set aside a, a full few hours because once you begin, you won't be able to stop. The perfect fraud is exactly what a good book should be. Dazzling plot, unforgettable characters, emotional depth, all presented in a fresh new voice that is sure to make Ellen LaCourt a household name. Very, very excited about this book. It goes on sale in June. Um, just a quick one from me, Beijing Payback by Daniel Nye. It's um, a debut and it is a really, really fun. Um, I've been to Beijing before, so this is a very cool kind of, um, for anyone, but for me it was extra special. Um, it's a debut thriller where this young man basically finds out that his father, who was murdered in a seemingly random act of violence, actually had a lot of secrets. Um, he owned this uh, string of Chinese restaurants, but actually he was involved um, with this international crime syndicate, and certain seedy characters from his father's past start appearing in Victor, the son's life. And Victor wants to get to the bottom of what exactly happened and why his father was murdered. So he travels to Beijing um, to get to the bottom of his father's history. Um, it's, again, it's a thriller, it's pacey. Um, there's a lot of like action and great set pieces. I totally see this as a movie, um, fingers crossed. Um, this is just a really fresh voice and I think a really great perspective that doesn't, you know, China's in the news all the time. It's very easy to see this whole thing as like a very other, like there, there would be the other. This puts you on the ground and really fleshes out um, stories from both sides. I love it. So it's coming July 23rd, that's Beijing Payback. So next we have Girl in the Rearview Mirror by Kelsey Ray Dimberg. This is a debut that we're all really excited about. This is, thank you, yeah. this is going to be such a great one. And it's really, it's a noir thriller, but it's really modern. And it's really, I mean, it's an amazing voice. So debut, we're so excited about this one. Um, if you're a fan of AJ Finn or, um, or Alifair Burke, this is perfect for you. And in this story, we follow a young nanny in Arizona in a prominent family, a political family, a son of a senator. She kind of embeds herself in this family and takes care of their young daughter, Amabel. And she kind of sees this son of a senator who was an ex-football player, kind of has a past, and this perfect wife who has everything. She sees them kind of using the daughter as a prop. She's just there as like, oh, this is our daughter. And so she really feels for her, and she becomes this nanny but another mother and also she really enjoys getting to know the father and she kind of she just becomes part of this family and then uh, this girl comes out of nowhere and tells her <laughs> that she has this secret about Philip who is the the son of the senator who she's working for and she needs to get close to him and he's done her wrong and she needs her help um, and so Finn who's the main character decides that you know that could be true so she's this family is her family, so she feels like she has to be on the defense, too. And she's going to figure out who's lying. Is it Philip or is it this girl? Also, who is this girl? Where would she come from? She literally is just in her rearview mirror everywhere she goes. She can't <laughs> get away from her. I love this cover, too, by the way. Um, so we see her kind of go into this insanity. She has a past, Finn does, and it comes out, and she just feels like she has to figure out what's going on. But it's really modern in a way. It's political, but it's not in Washington. It's in Phoenix. And it's kind of noir, but instead of going into a, a PI's office, it's this little girl who needs the help, and she's this nanny's going to help her. It's really great. There's a great letter from the editor, and I won't go into it because we don't have the time, but go check it out. It's on Edelweiss. I have everything highlighted because it's a really cool letter. Um, and I have a quote, but I'm going to move on. But it's really a great voice. Please check it out. I loved this book. 
and it comes out in June, June 18th. One more for you. One more. Oh, okay. The next one is Killer Across the Table. Very different than what I just talked about. So you might know Johnny Douglas. Um, he was fictionalized in Silence of the Lambs. He's also really popular from, and also Criminal Minds. He has these fictional characters. He's an FBI profiler. He's like the OG FBI profiler. He created all of these things we talk about and learning how serial killers work. Uh, Mindhunter is based on his book, Mindhunter. He is the main character. It's fictionalized, but he it's based on John Douglas. And so with his co-author and longtime collaborator, Mark Olshaker, they've written this next book. This is a, the next one after the success of Mindhunter. And so if you like the show, the second season's coming soon. We don't know exactly when, but it might have the same DNA as that show. It, it goes through four killers that he's profiled and interviewed in person. Um, but then he also, the killers themselves, the four, are maybe not that well known, but he puts in different people and big high profile killers that he has interviewed, Charles Manson, Dennis Rader, all of these people. He puts them within those smaller people, well, smaller in vague terms, people that you might not know of, uh, those killers. And it, so you kind of get a best of both worlds. You also get some of the scenes from the show. If you're a fan, he'll be like, mm, that's not exactly how that worked, let me tell you. It's really interesting. I'm a big true crimer with the rise of all of the true crime in podcast serial. This is right up your alley if you're a big true crime person um, or a fan of the show even. And it's just like the dark human curiosity we have of why people work and why they do what they do. He kind of dives into that more and tells us what we can look out for, maybe what we can help people who have these issues. Maybe we can not foster this in them um and it's just really thrilling and bone chilling but also heartbreaking at the same time uh yeah it's chewy oh my <laughs> god that's chewy all right well i'll take it on. i'll bring it on home now yep. so speaking of thrilling and chilling with two minutes to go i'm gonna talk about two books here i go <laughs> sorry okay no we're great are you kidding okay linwood barkley elevator pitch linwood barkley uh is a internationally best-selling author uh, of, of 19 novels um, including the noise downstairs no time for goodbye this is an edge of your seat thriller about elevators <laughs> yes it all begins on a Monday four people get into an elevator in Manhattan in an office tower they press the, the, the button to their floor they go up to the top boom down to the bottom <laughs> that's what <laughs> happens to them and that's just the beginning. It appears to be a terrible tragedy, except it happens again on Tuesday and another ho at another office building, and then it happens again on Wednesday. And now they know something's up. You should really shouldn't take the elevator. You should put your sneakers on. No. Um, uh, so it, it actually really it sends, the, sends the city into, into chaos. You know, the, it's the capital of finance and media and entertainment, and they are literally plunged into chaos. And so what's going on here and who's behind this why are they doing this there's some and there's a there's a great big uh, 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 new tower that's being um, un unveiled and and everybody's been waiting to, to go to this thing and now everybody's petrified um, and also there's a fingerless body found in the High Line which is a park in, Man in Manhattan mm -hmm. and um, now is there a connection so there's these two detectives that are and a, and a journalist who are racing against time uh, to figure out what's happened, um, what's going on here be before this big ribbon cutting of this next big tower in Manhattan. So it's 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 just edgy or see thriller. It does for elevators what Psycho did for showers and Jaws did for sharks and the beach. Yes! <laughs> Lastly, here we go, Louisiana. It's 10.50, I know. It's our last seconds, but fight like a mother. How a grassroots movement took on the gun lobby and why women will change the world. This is by Shannon Watts. She was a stay-at-home mother. And uh, the shooting at uh, Sandy Hook Elementary in Connecticut shook her to the core, and she started a simple Facebook group uh, to connect with other frustrated mothers, and that grew into Moms Demand Action, which is now a national movement with millions of supporters, a powerful grassroots network of local chapters in 50 states. There's so much in this book. You must go to her website, go on edelweiss.com, find out all about this book. Uh, again, as Chris was saying before, the... Um, the number of uh, people who have pages and pages of people who have 
who have supported this book, politicians, entertainers, celebrities, finance people, everybody is on board with this book because she is not left, she is not right, she's right down the middle, and she is uh, appealing to people's common sense about you know, what needs to be done. She's not saying no guns. She's, she is NRA's biggest, they're afraid of her, and that's a good thing. So uh, please check out Fight Like a Mother by Shannon Watts. She is, she's a fierce woman, and uh, she is, she's here to stay. So that is the last one. I hate to rush through that book because it is so important. Um, but again, you can find out more about that on Edelweiss. We did it. It's uh, 50 minutes in. We've covered a lot of books. Um, and if you have any questions, please write to us at librarylovefest.com. And um, I don't know. Is there anything else we want to say? No, just thank you for having us. It was a lot of fun. And uh, uh, yeah, again, this. yeah, we'll we'll be sending uh, a few lucky winners some some books. Send you some books. Yeah, just write to us. Tell us what you need. Thank you, Louisiana. We are gonna bobble our heads out of here. Have some beignets, and thank you so much for your hospitality and including <laughs> us in your conference. Take care.